and I mean season three back. And this is the comics, sci-fi, and fantasy fans fantastic form. Woo, I thought I was gonna forget, but I didn't. Uh, today, we're gonna start off this season with women's issues in comics, which is something important to me. So we have a fantastic panel for you today. I'm gonna start to my far right with Eden Miller, who is the blogger of Comics Girl, and you should definitely check her out. Can you give us the URL, Eden? It's just comicsgirl.com. There you go. Easy. We, easy. We also have Brandon Hallmark, and uh, he is a great lover of both comics. Well, and women. He's, a, he's a triple threat, <laughs> comics, gaming, and anime. Mm -hmm. And we also have Kat Bittner, super comics mom. <laughs> and lover of graphic novels and also a very, very funny lady. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so let's break the ice because I think the three of you know very well that I'm a very big, goofy person. So to start off with women's issues in comics, let's start with a little fun. Which female superhero has the most stripper-like costume? Psylocke. <laughs> I was going to say Psylocke. Um, <laughs> Black Canary. The fishnets, right? Yes. Ooh, oh, fishnets. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's a good call. <laughs> Kat, She's at least what about got a jacket, you? though. Uh, True. I have to agree with Black Canary. So. Uh, you got to get make up your own. Uh, no. Okay, Black Canary without her jacket. <laughs> 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 Stripping. <Yeah. laughs> Although, back in the day, there was Eric Lawson's uh, Rapture character, and she had the hooker boots. So that was a really good stripper. And when did Wonder Woman lose her hooker boots? She always she had the like two inch heels for for a long time going, oh. and at some point they realized that's really not practical because no one can run in those. Mm -hmm. oh, I guess if you can fly. Yeah, yeah strippers yeah. can run. You in can wear your stripper sight. boots. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> well, Wonder Woman's a good place it. for us to start. But I remember reading recently a post where the woman was talking about a, a novel for superheroes, a novelization. And she called Wonder Woman the glorified secretary of the Justice League. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, you know, that might have been true back, back in the, uh, the early days of Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was founded to be the premier woman of superherodom. Um, she was invented by, believe it or not, the guy who created the lie detector. And he and his wife noticed that there, there weren't very strong women characters in comics. And, uh, and hence, you know, the lie detector came out in the, the lasso of truth. And they really wanted to feature um, what makes women strong versus what make men strong. But it quickly devolved into kind of this voyeuristic, uh, uh, every episode, Wonder Woman, every comic got tied up by her own lasso of truth. And, and her partners and, and boss came in to save her. If you, if you look up some of the, the history of Wonder Woman, it's, it's a little shameful. Um, but as, as she's grown, and, and particularly as George Perez took her through the 1980s, she grew into this, this as strong as Superman um, character that, that uh, you know, is a warrior princess. And, and diversified quite a bit. Right, but, because I think it, it, it came a point where she became the balance between the two, the kind of gusto that Batman has to go after whatever he's like unstoppable, which she is, but also the diplomacy that Superman carries. So she's kind of the mashup and this, this point of balance between the two characters. Well, I have to disagree, and I mm -hmm. think that's part of, part of Wonder Woman's problem, is mm -hmm. a lot of people do see her as that balance between Superman and Batman. Mm -hmm. She's not like Superman or Batman. She's on her own pillar. Kat, what are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting because as a mom, I'm, I'm not r doing the comic books with my daughter. There's You Can Read series where they have, um, they do have Wonder Woman, they do have Batman, and there's a point when Batman and um, Superman are trying to fight this dragon and they say, we can't defeat this dragon. We need Wonder Woman to oh, help us because she has, great. yeah, she has this power that uh, magic that will help us defeat the dragon and other stuff too that goes into her origin where she comes from a place that's all these strong female warriors and it's I rather read that to her she's two years old yeah. than to have these prince princesses and which wait for people to you know to yeah. rescue them right not to sound cliche but <laughs> yeah. empowered women mm -hmm. right. so to kind of move on from Wonder Woman 
who writes women well in comics? Um, you got to give props to Gail Simone. She yeah. writes, mm -hmm. she writes balanced characters no matter who they are, yeah. and uh, and there are some nasty women in the Secret Six that. Uh, and you need that. You yeah. need that balance of different personality types. Eden was saying something very similar earlier. Yeah, I think that you know. It, there's sort of this pressure for like strong women to be flawless and that's not that's not what I want I want mm -hmm. them to be well-rounded people I want them to have things I can relate to and it's okay if like maybe one character is always chasing men and yeah. another woman's not interested in that it's like because you know there are different things appeal to different people Absolutely. and not all female characters have to be everything to everyone so you're mm -hmm. you're a big indie comics fan mm -hmm. who does a great job in indie comics um, well Strangers in Paradise by Terry Moore. It kind of yeah. fell apart towards the end, but <laughs> re still really fun. It was kind of a soap opera. Um, you know, a lot of other indie people like Alison Bechdel with Fun Home. Oh, yeah. You know, very autobiographical. Very um, well and, done. you know, so there, there's a lot of that that women are doing, like trying to tell their own stories. Right. There are a lot of, a lot of people who kind of go in and out of the, the industry, too, that are very good women's writers, and you wish you could see them more. People like Brian K. Vaughn or Joss mm -hmm. Whedon mm -hmm. or, or um, Alan Heinberg. Mm -hmm. You know, um, these are the creators of Runaways and and yeah. The Young Avengers and and Why the Last Man. Yeah, I particularly um, like uh, what Brian K. Vaughn does with. I, I write. I like the way he writes women. Again, he writes women. He doesn't write a woman. Um, Kat, what about you? Any calls? Well, I like Jo Chen. I'm very drawn to the cover art, oh, and yeah. she did some great cover art with R Runaways. Mm -hmm. And also, probably Local, I liked. Local the, was great. Was Brian really Wood. Good. Yeah, with Brian Wood. Yeah. Do you think there's a problem with, uh, with not enough women in the industry right now? I mean, we've mostly been talking about men except for Gail Simone. Gail Simone got her, her job in the industry she was a hairdresser in Portland, Oregon, or, right. or somewhere near mm -hmm. Portland, um, and got her job because she wrote a, a comics blog, and somebody picked her up and, and thought she had some interesting stories to tell. But other than Gail and Catherine Immerman, I can't really think of any female writers in the industry. Oh, yeah, the, yeah there's Becky Cloonan. There's so oh, many yeah, yeah, female. Yeah. You've got, yeah. let's say you've got Carla Speed McNeil, You've got Cloonan, uh, the lady who writes uh, Castle Waiting, yeah, what's her L name? Yeah, Linda Medley. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of young female cartoonists coming up. There's yeah. a collective in New York called Pete's Island. I know Julie Wurtz and Kate Beaton are in that. Um, there's Raina Telegmeyer who did mm -hmm. Smile. Um, Hope Larson who did... Oh, yeah, Hope oh, yeah. Larson's um, amazing. She's Good. doing a Wrinkle in Time adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there, there is a generation. I think it's just you have to look to the indie side. Are those I people going to be able agree. to break in into I think Marvel they've been DC, breaking though. in though. I don't, know, I don't know if they want to. They may not, but they have been breaking in. They've been doing both sides. And I think we should talk more about the women working in comics behind the scenes, but we have to do that when we come back because uh, this segment's gone. So I'm going to throw it out to Yuli, who is going to have an interview with Joe Chen, who Kat mentioned, who's amazing. Check out her artwork. And we're also going to do a segment on Jeffy's Comics History Museum. So check it out and see you soon. We're here at the Washington, D.C. Comic Convention talking to comic artist Joe Chen. I am most familiar with your work from having seen you do Racer X and uh, there are a number of covers of The Runaways. If you're familiar with the Xbox video game, there's a game called Fable. I've been doing the cover for their package like since Fable 1, 2, and I'm actually now working on 3. It should be out soon this year. And I also work on some, some of the Dark Horse uh, title, uh, Star Wars uh, Invasion. Do you have a particular project that is a favorite? Favorite? I would say Runaways because they give me a lot of freedom, creative freedom to do any experiment I want. But the Buffy, I mean, it's also a fun project to work on, but I'm more limited to, you know, that I have to draw those characters based on the actors, you know. How did you get started drawing comic books? Actually, my sister, she's the one who got me started. And she, we used to draw, like, the Japanese-style comic books. We call that manga. Oh, manga, yeah. Yeah, manga. 
And because I I always look up to my sister, and she was for her from my point of view, she's like a god. So everything she does, I imitate. And I would say I was always a painfully shy kid. And、uh, drawing is also a good way to kind of express myself without interact directly with other people.、Uh, the, I let the drawing talk for myself. And、uh, the more the more I draw, the more I kind of got into it. So by the time when I was about you know fourteen, I was considering going to art school because I want to go become more sophisticated. I want to become a professional. Then I went to the art school. In Taiwan, I was born and educated in Taiwan, and I learned all the traditional stuff, you know, oil painting, watercolors, and sculptings, and and、uh, I just combine what I learned from school and with manga, so kind of create a new style. It's more of a hybrid style. <laughs> But so far, people have pretty good reactions about it. Yes, and、uh, I would say the first job—that's how I actually got my first job in the United States. It's during the Speed Racer comics. It's like spin-off series of Speed Racer. It's called the Racer X, and because I was doing the the Japanese style, but that kind of helped me get into the industry in the United States, and slowly then work for like DC and Marvel and Dark Horse, etc. Okay.、Uh, what characters would you like to illustrate in the future? I always think Batman's really cool. <laughs> I wish sometimes that I have the chance to do you know a Batman. Some Batman covers, yes. Okay, well, I mean, hopefully not just the covers. You'd like to do some、uh, actual books,、uh, the interiors, wouldn't you? I always have a passion towards interior, but I think because again, I was, I, I used to wor- work for the industry in Asia, so I'm kind of used to the Asian way. It's, you know, it's very different from the American way. The American way is more like assembly line. You have the writers to write the story. And you have the penciler and the inker and the colorist. And Asia is more like、um, the artist. the The story is pretty much like a how do you say that? It's very personal. The way I say it is, the artist writes the story and、uh, and do all the penciling and inking, and they hire a system to do background and screen tone, etc. So, and it's pretty much like a. The thought.、Um, that's how, what is the right way to say it? The thought, the idea of the artists themselves. So, and for me,、uh, because I'm kind of used to the、uh, the Asian way, and plus I already developed my way of storytelling, you know, as like a writer artist. So by the time when I moved to the United States, I kind of find it difficult、uh, to work with other writers because the writers, different writers, they have their own vision about how the story should be told. And sometimes it could conflict with my what I want to do, and、uh, and also about working with the colors that could be a problem too because I might want to do things differently. So eventually I thought, well, maybe if I move to the, doing the cover work, paint as a painting color、um, cover, then I actually can have <laughs> like total control. So I'm more of a <laughs> control freak. <'cause laughs> We're standing here in downtown Baltimore at Jeppy's Entertainment Museum. We're going to go inside. And we're going to see some really awesome things. And now we're inside at the Jeppy's Entertainment Museum with Gina Jeppy. And you want to take a tour? Yeah, I would love to show you around. All right.、Um, this is my dad's private collection. As you may or may not know, it's about 30 years of his collecting. So we do have certified tours here at the museum, available from our docents and our curator. But The tour that I like to take is a little bit more personal, so I'm looking forward to showing you guys around. All right, very good. So the easiest place to start is our story in four colors room, which、okay. the locals kind of just call the comic book room. Okay. So that's going to be up here on the left hand side. All right. And if you're a comic fan at all, this is probably going to be your favorite spot in the、oh, museum. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what have we got here? In here we have our prestige case. This is the comic book room. Starting first at our prestige case, which is where we house the Action Comics number one, which was the first appearance of Superman, and Detective Comics twenty-seven, which was the first appearance of Batman. 
Over here we have our collection of big little books. These were huge in the 30s. They were 10 cents a piece. And what's really unique about these big little books is this collection right here was actually purchased from Whitman Publishing as all their file copies, which means that these books have not only never been sold, they've never been read. The bindings haven't even been broken. So um, these were, as I said, very popular. They were the largest 10 cent sellers until about 1938 when a character was introduced via comic books, which you may know, named Superman. So right. Superman kind of pushed the little big books out of their popular spot for a while. Well, what's great about this room is you, there's really so much to see that you could stay in here for hours alone just seeing what the comic room has to offer. Mm -hmm. But over here in this case, you're going to see what some would think is perhaps maybe part of the 20 most boring years in comic history. And the reason they say that is not anything against the characters, because there's characters you'll recognize like Batman and the Hulk. But what it was is when the comics code was there and this, that little stamp you see up in the upper corner, the mm -hmm. little white stamp, that is when they were basically regular regulating comics, kind of like an FCC would, telling them what they can and cannot put in comics. And a little interesting fact is, is that um, Stan Lee was uh, the creator of Spider-Man, of course, along with many other classic characters, right. did an issue of Amazing Spider-Man, and Spider-Man's, or Peter Parker's friend, had taken drugs, and the comics code was completely against the issue. They would not put their authority on it and their approval, and so they published the comic even without it, and it was a huge success, and now it's a very classically known comic. But they kind of realized at the time that we actually don't need to have this approval okay. in order to be able to publish these comics and let them sell well. So comics code is something that's kind of dissolved along the time and as you go through the timeline you'll see most issues don't even have it after a certain period. One of the great things about this museum the way it's laid out is uh, it's definitely a preference of my dad that he did not want it to be gallery style imaging down the wall meaning that everything was at your eye line all laid up symmetrically so instead he wanted it to be where as you walk through you have to look all over the place to see things and that's exactly how it is so as you walk through here you'll see movie posters you'll see uh, animation cells and actually it's funny because right over here if you come with me okay. There's a Oswald the Rabbit poster. Mm -hmm. And the funny little story about Oswald the Rabbit is it was originally supposed to be a big character that would launch Disney. But they had a bad business deal and they lost the rights to Oswald the Rabbit. So that's when they created Mickey Mouse as their second choice, which of course we know worked out very well for them. Okay. But not that long ago, they actually got back the rights to Oswald the Rabbit in a deal with Disney, who owns ABC, releasing sportscaster Al Michaels to NBC. So it was kind of funny to think that Al Michaels was traded for Oswald the Rabbit, to kind of put it, you know, in loose terms. So it's a fun little character to tell that story about and that people usually recognize but don't know the history behind, so. Right. And personally, I think that, um what, Disney, they want out. <laughs> yeah. We're in our expanding universe gallery right now, and Star Wars is, to me, what's unique about it is it's not just a fan base, it's a culture. People who love Star Wars have loved it, even if they weren't born when the first movie came out, but just big lovers of it, so this is definitely a popular room in the museum, and one of my favorite pieces in here is the Revenge of the Jedi poster, which is the original poster from the movie, um, before the title was changed to Return of the Jedi, and the idea was is that revenge was an emotion unbefitting a Jedi, so they changed it, but it's cool to see the piece. So it was... Uh, um, a really cool piece to have in here because people see it and they're like, I don't remember a movie called Revenge of the Jedi because it didn't exist. It uh, changed titles but before anybody even realized it. But some very cool pieces of movie memorabilia in here, toys again that you'll recognize. And then even as toys progressed into things such as Happy Meal toys and iconic characters from like, you know, fast food restaurants. Like everybody was really getting in on the game that they wanted to create a character that would live on. And they have, from Burger King to Ronald McDonald, they're all represented in here as well. What I love about pop culture collecting is, is it is such a huge part of our country's history to look at things and be like, yes, this related to this time, or I remember when this was going on in the world and I had this particular item. But I think it really, if anything, emphasizes that the more creative you are, the more successful you can be because all of these things were creation of somebody's imagination and so many of them have lived on like eternally after that. So, and it's just always fun to look at. I mean, I'm an art lover, same way, but it's never the same as me to walk through an art gallery as to walk through here and be able to talk to everybody and see the things that they remember from childhood. Okay, well, it looks like we're done. Uh, thanks for like having us. Absolutely. And it looks like we've seen everything except for the gift shop. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that means that we have to come back then. Of course, fantastic. Forum is always welcome here at Jeppy's Entertainment Museum. Remember a great thing about a gift shop? 
because that's where you start your collection today. So. Uh, okay. And could you tell us where you're located again? Absolutely. We're so convenient and so easy to find because we're right next to Camden Yards, literally. So we're on Camden Street, 301 West Camden Street in Baltimore, Maryland, and we're on the second floor of Camden Station. So literally, if you run the length of the warehouse, you see a brick building at the end, that's us. So we're right on the second floor. Our website is www.jeppiesmuseum.com. And of course, you know, we have a Facebook page and we invite everybody to follow us because we're always doing all kinds of fun events here like we throw a tea party for kids in the spring we're doing a murder mystery dinner in the fall we have our zombie girl event um, around Mardi Gras time so there's always something fun going on and you know we just really invite everybody it's for any ages to come down and enjoy and we just love everybody to get a chance to see it so all right well thanks Gina we really appreciate it thanks so much for being here all right Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I hope you enjoyed your visit to Jeffy's Comics. <laughs> we were also bemoaning the demise of Minx Comics, which was a sector or an imprint of DC mm -hmm. that um, promoted comics for young girls. There was some great stuff, the New York Four, there was Blabbermouth, actually by Mike Carey and his daughter Lou. Very good stuff. So we miss that. Um, miss comics aimed at women, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, like the the big two, you know, Marvel and DC really tried to jump on to finding that that young women's audience um, when it became clear that that manga was really mm -hmm. reaching out to mm -hmm. women. Right. Um, and so you saw things like the tsunami line from from Marvel earlier this decade, where they created Runaways and and things like that, trying to to tap into that audience, and it for some reason just really did not take. Except for Runaways, none of those series from Tsunami, not even Mystique, survived. Well, I, I wonder if there's a difference between creating it as a function of who you are and creating it to try to catch, you know, catch a hold of an audience because it does come off very fake to me. A lot um, of women like Neil Gaiman, though. Yeah. Uh, so with the Sandman series, it's very introductory. You can, it's yeah. easy to get into. But it I, I think with the Minx. Books, uh, you know, they were good books. They were, yeah, know, they were. But I think it was just an issue of marketing. It's like they they weren't getting them into the hands of this audience. They, you know, they they went up until that point. Hey, give this to your girlfriend if I you think have one. I think that's basically yeah. what it ended up to be. They were hoping to get the girlfriends that were dragged into the comic book stores. Or yeah, relying, or relying on comic book nerds to have yeah. girlfriends yeah. is a bad marketing <laughs> technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that you guys mentioned girlfriends because one of the big tropes in comics is, of course, uh, the girlfriend, uh, the, the female in comics who is simply the girlfriend, as Gail Simone so eloquent, eloquently wrote it. And also the flip side or the, the female counterpart analog. So what thoughts do you guys have on those characters? And mention some of the characters that were that had their start in, in those ways. And you have you have characters like like Miss Marvel that have been tried to Marvel's been trying to pluck up and and uh, I dare say, you know, Miss Marvel is a is a feminist icon. And I dare say that she she's actually outgrown in popularity. You know, mo I would say that more fans know who Miss Marvel is than Captain Marvel That's that really started her. I don't know enough about Miss Marvel, but Eden, do you have thoughts? No, you don't know I, either? I, I, yeah, well, who are much. some of your calls on that, that um, topic? Barbara Gordon, you know, became Oracle. And that's just, that was like a completely different, different take on it. And right. probably a much more interesting character than if she'd stayed, you know, kind of the, the superhero in. Yeah, it's like the pocket Batman. You yeah, know, the, the Batman mini me. Yeah, right. but you had to mm -hmm. shoot her in the spine true, to get true. her there. True, true. And that, well, yeah, that but wasn't, you didn't that have good, that with the following Batgirl, who is an assassin, and you know, kind of emotionally jacked up. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there is this kind of movement towards taking the women out of the, their, the pockets of the male heroes and they're out there for on their own. Yeah, I just DC's, wish they'd give them their own names. DC's done a much better job of that within the past decade. You have characters yeah, like true. Manhunter and, and the, you know, using the birds of prey and, and right. um, just several viable female characters, Batwoman even, mm -hmm. who, Batwoman. who really, you know, is not an amalgam to Batman. You have, you have Renee Montoya who's become the question and and just and a good one yeah yeah very the, good question these viable women characters suddenly jumping out of DC that are not the paragon they don't suffer from that paragon problem and they're starting to have girlfriends who are on equal footing 
with the male characters, mm -hmm. which I think, rather than it being, it's about this male character, and then here's his girlfriend who's you mean frozen the Mary until Jane? he talks to her. Yeah, right. the Mary Jane. Yeah. Now you've gotten, they're on equal footing, they work together, they fight together, Green Arrow and Black Canary. You know, these, right. these kind you of things. You don't have the girlfriend stuck in the refrigerator anymore. <laughs> right. Which or is not as much. Not a good place yeah. for her. You have mm -hmm. to you have to give props to writers who are trying to do different things. Mm -hmm. um, their their intent is good. For instance, the J. Michael Straczynski uh, current arc that's that's been going on. Um, most people aren't very happy with it, and the idea was good. The idea that that we need to shift Wonder Woman and, and make her a more viable character, but the execution. Uh, I think on these things are really bad. Yeah. And, well, you know, that's why I think independent comics are so important to portraying women. Right. I, we were talking earlier about Castle Waiting, which mm -hmm. is by um, uh, Linda Medley. Linda yeah. Medley. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, you've got these women in this fairy tale world, but instead of them needing to be saved, they somehow make their way and take good care of themselves. And there's there's something very appealing about about these women. And we didn't even get to talk about it, which is the body types and, mm -hmm. and our joke that, you know, all the women in superhero dumb need is a good bra. Quickly, thoughts on um, the body type of women in comics. W where does that come I, from? I think, you know, even, even female readers enjoy sexy women, but it's just when they all start looking the same, it just gets boring. You know, women come in all different shapes and sizes. And I think even in sort of fantastic world, the art should reflect that. Totally agree, mm -hmm. Brendan, your thoughts? A good artist will, will be able to reflect that. Like, but we, do they? I, I think certain artists do. Um, there, there are people like David Aja out there who, who are fantastic artists and can draw different body types for men and for women. But, but, but yeah, but I do think that it is more appealing to see all these various body types. You, you can also differentiate you know, the size of hips, the yes. face, yeah. and, a, and a talented artist can really do that. I'm going to have to wrap it up. But I do want to mention one of my favorite artists for girls' body types is Ross Campbell. He somehow oh, yeah. manages to capture, I mean, a wealth of variety, skin tone, body type. He's pretty great. Check him out. I think we need, like, another show to really delve into more of the thing, uh, more of women's issues. And there's some dirty things Brandon's been dying to say. We just don't have time for it. Yes. So thank you <laughs> for coming back for season three of the comic sci-fi and fantasy fans fantastic form. Yes, I did it again. It was great having you. I'm sure there's going to be, like, some kind of thing happening here where you can visit the website. I hope so. We're making it here. You never know. But anyway, come check us out. It was good to see you. Thanks.